All right, now we're gonna talk about death threats. This is a world. This is a world premiere. This is a world. Okay, so hey, you guys. Um, I don't know. I don't know how I want to do this. I might just do this as a sit here and kind of talk to you guys about some stuff that I've been going through and respond to some things that you guys have been saying to me and based on things that I've been saying to you. But uh, I'm gonna keep it really short. This is not gonna be like a 30 minute video, but then I say that and then this may end up being like a 30 minute video. Okay, so first of all, um, you know, you guys, I told you that I was doing the master cleanse and a lot of people were troubled about that. So I wanna talk about that. But before I get into that, I wanna talk a little bit about the, the death threats. Okay, so um, there have been a couple of them and I don't know how I feel about it. Like, I don't want to be concerned because I know that most death threats that people receive via the internet are just, you know, they're crap. Like, they're people who are just doing, you know, they're behind the safety of their screen and they say things. Um, however, you know, I just want to know, I just want people to know that that's, that's out there. That's out there in the air. And, um, yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. And, um... I think the part of it that's most interesting is that there's been so much talk about who's violent and who's not violent and who's racist and who's not racist. And it feels to me like the most criticism about, you know, violence is coming from a direction of so much violence right now that I'm beginning to think that we have a real, we have a, like a psychological, we have like a national, international, Western um, mass hysteria right now. There seems to be this mass hysteria going on right now where people who are existing within extremely violent cultures have no sense of themselves, no ability to see the impact that they might be having on the world around them and only see themselves as the targets of this violence, this impending violence. And, you know, the whole idea of like preemptive strikes, right, is based on this idea that we're going to do this thing to them before they do it to us, not considering the fact that maybe you want to do it to them just because you want to do it to them, right? So that's something that I really want to call out uh, as something that I'm aware of. So an example is that, you know, I've been accused of being racist in some of the rhetoric that I might use in my videos, but in, you know, calling out the tiniest bit of what might be, you know, Islamophobia, what might be, you know, um, misdirected hostility towards the Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter movement. I've gotten hundreds and hundreds of comments that all go right into my spam filter, but hundreds and hundreds of comments from people, you know, using the most foul, derogatory language, anti, like homophobic and racist language. So it's bizarre to me. And I am sure that sharing this information, there are people who are going to listen to that and immediately in their minds, they're going to be like erasing. It's, it's not, it already didn't happen. It already didn't happen because that kind of thing only happens from the other people. I also realized that there's a real, um, there's a real kind of a delusional, <laughs> this delusional spirit in the air where people are, you know, the people who are concerned with say, um, and you know, the people who are concerned with, with global warming, right? With climate change, the people who are concerned with maybe over militarization, people who are concerned with, um, overconsumption are being targeted as the cancer of society right now by people who don't want to think about those things. And I do wonder, like, what is that? What causes people to completely flip the script 
and not, not only fail to recognize the impact that they might be having, but to see the person who might be concerned with making some kind of a change as the problem. And I don't know if that is a question of believing in propaganda or really just some kind of mass psychosis. But it's troubling. I'd really like to know what you guys think about that. Yeah, and, and the result of it is that the person, you know, me, the person who is, you know, coming from a place of nonviolence and calling things out and trying to see things from opposite directions and being accused of being in an echo chamber, but yet a group of people who left the exact same comment, like, you know, 12, 20 people leaving exactly the same comment don't understand that they're actually in the echo chamber. But that's a whole other thing. So I want to talk a little bit about this master cleanse thing that everybody is, um, not everybody, because some people are like, oh, master cleanse, whatever, and then other people are really concerned by that. Um, I want to talk a little bit, first of all, I want to talk about my own history of disordered eating. I, um, I come from a history of of overconsumption. I'm an overeater, right? And that overeating at some times explodes into bulimia, full full blown bulimia, where I'm eating and then purging. I'm binging and then purging. But um, for me, I've never been anorexic. I've never been at a place in my life where there was a question about whether I was going to be eating enough food. For me, it has always been about a, you know, a lack of self, I don't even want to call it self-control because it's, you know, the eating is the way to get into control, right? It's the consumption because whatever is happening, like psychologically, whatever is happening emotionally, I'm not dealing with that. Instead, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm eating, right? And food, um, there's not an off switch for me. So like, for example, where somebody might be like, oh, I'm going to have like some chips. I'm going to have like a whole bag of chips. Somebody else is going to have like, you know, you know, a piece of candy. I'm going to eat like the whole bag of candy. And in my history, when I wasn't vegan, that was like a whole box of donuts or a whole like cake or a whole something, right? So I've never been someone who has struggled with eating. I've never had that as a problem. And so um, I've I've been able to control it more or less, especially when I'm when I'm working and the way that I've made up for the fact that I don't have self-control with my eating is sometimes I'll get into um, like I'll I'll work out like working out too much so I'll spend like three or four hours in the gym and like spending two hours on the treadmill a day was for me that was more of you know that was more of me kind of that was how I dealt with, with my, my eating issues. I never though, I've never missed a meal. I'm not a miss a meal person. That is not me. In fact, I'll have, you know, all of my meals. And then if I end up somewhere else, you know, I'll have some, some of that same meal again in secret. So just so you know, it's not about, about that. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind that not every person who has an eating disorder is, you know, is a, is a person who is, is restricting, right? And for me, dieting hasn't, you know, dieting for me is finding my way to just consuming what is recommended and not overeating. So when I'm restricting, I'm getting like closer to what is a reasonable number of calories in a day as opposed to twice or three times the number of calories that I that I should be consuming in a day. Um, and so that has brought me like into obesity. It's, you know, consistently being in a state of being like right at the border of, of like the maximum weight based on what is kind of recommended for my height, right? But, you know, I don't give that so much. I don't pay so much attention to that. But the question with me has never been about not having enough to eat. And so, um, uh, a few years ago, actually, it was back in, 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 in 2010 when I, you know, did my first what you call like a cleanse. Some people call them juice feast. I didn't think that that was going to be a possibility to, for me. I didn't think that I had the self-control to go for three days only consuming juices. 
I did not think that that was a possibility for me. And it was during that time that I was able to, ref first of all, reflect on what I had been doing, right? I believed that I couldn't go for 10 minutes without putting some kind of, you know, food in my mouth, without chewing on something. And to go for three days was, for me, kind of a life changer. Now, there are other things that went along through this. I had gone through actually some other processes that had helped me to kind of get control of myself and to feel a little bit better about myself. And that had happened like really just shortly before um, discovering this, you know, three day cleanse, right? So there had been a major change that had gotten me a little bit um, more balanced about myself. And I was kind of coming to terms with food anyway. And so then to do this three day cleanse and to realize that for me, that was, that was a, a, a milestone. That was a huge undertaking. That was not something that anybody in my life, in my world, was concerned about. They were like, oh, is he really going to be able to do this? So then I did it, right? And immediately after that, I discovered um, raw food. I discovered raw food. And so for me, raw food was a bit of a lifesaver because what it meant was I was only able to consume, it limited the things that I could eat and it made life for me actually very simple. It meant that all of those foods that I was binging on were suddenly just, they weren't, they weren't part of my diet anymore. They weren't even a possibility. So this being a raw foodist was, was kind of a perfect, solution to what had been a lifelong problem and that was just not even knowing how to think about like square meals what square meals i don't know what that is right and it's a little too late in life for me to be trying to discover what that is right so for me to be able to completely break away from the the a lifetime of overeating and then move into a place where i was able to consume abundantly, but I was consuming abundantly foods that were um, not only satisfying, but they were, but they were really nourishing my body. And so then went through a complete change. Like I went from being, you know, you know, one type of body person to a very different type of body person. And which was a, it was a great thing for me. It was a really amazing thing for me. And I was able to maintain that for years. And then I keep telling, I've told this story many, many times. There was a, a there was, you know, we went through some, um, a kind of a disaster here in, in Brooklyn and uh, my community was completely shut down by it. And suddenly I didn't have access to for me, what was food? Because, you know, I, I was thriving on fresh vegetables, I was thriving on fresh fruits, I was thriving on nuts and seeds, and suddenly those things weren't available. I had to go to the like corner bodega where it wasn't raw nuts, it was like the roasted nuts and they came in a plastic package, right? So suddenly I was, you know, I was eating potatoes and I was eating rice and it wasn't like that was immediately bad for me, but once I went back into consuming on a regular basis cooked foods, when cooked foods became like the center of my diet again, it just basically meant that, you know, it was no holds barred. It was like I could suddenly, I was like, well, if I'm eating that, then I might as well eat like this canned version of it, or I might eat this like packaged version of it. And then suddenly I'm having, you know, you know, I'm having, you know, Oreos, right? So. By the time I got to, got through um, that terrible winter, I had you know gotten back into eating a lot of things that I knew were just not good for me, and so the way that I was able to break back out of that was by doing a master cleanse, and. Um, that kind of got things back on track for me and I was able to go back to eating raw foods, which was a really, really amazing thing. And so spent, you know, a fair deal of time being raw again and then it was summer and then got back into the fall and then went back to teaching and the problem the next time wasn't so much about what was available to me. I was working a lot because I'd bought the house in Detroit and so suddenly I had 
a house that I was renovating in Detroit and I had to pay for out of pocket. And then I had my life here in New York, which is very, very expensive. And so I was basically working 60 hours a week to maintain my life here in New York City and my life in, in Detroit. And so, again, you know, it was not possible for me to, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't able to get to the food that I needed, right? I needed to transport a lot of food or I needed to order food in. And so, you know, once I'm ordering food in, there's suddenly so much more salt and so much more fat in those foods. And I'm not controlling who's, you know, the way that the food is prepared in the same way. And so then finding myself, you know, again, off the wagon. And that was, you know, that went for like another three years. And I was able to keep things fairly in balance, but I wasn't at that optimal level of health that I had been when I was just eating raw food. And so you guys remember last summer that I did that whole raw food, and that was great. Last summer was amazing. But then <laughs> I spent the winter in Detroit, and suddenly when I didn't have access to a market every day, and it wasn't easy to hop in the car and go driving someplace, and you know, it basically my life turned into a food desert and it was back to that thing where I wasn't, I didn't have access to the foods that I could, um, that I could thrive on. And I wasn't working last year and you know, I did the whole run fundraiser to raise, you know, money to, to do some work on the house, which was amazing. And thank you guys again, everyone who gave to the Winter Is Coming to Altspace campaign. But you know, there wasn't a lot of money for food. I was, living on like $250 a month for everything, for food, for, for everything, you know, other than utilities. Um, that was it, $250 a month. And so it was, you know, it was ramen. It was frozen vegetables. I was getting food at the dollar store. Um, so again, it was, it was not a very healthy way to live. So I find myself back in Brooklyn and suddenly having access to a fairway and the farm is getting started up again and I can go and get food on the farm anytime that I want to. I can basically get whatever it is that I want, but still there's this like, how do I shift back into it? And that was my whole reason for doing the master cleanse. I got into my old clothes and they did not fit. And it was very clear that I needed to do something and I needed to do something fast. And so this is hopefully my way of getting myself a little bit back on track and getting things a little bit more under control. So I don't know, I'm sure you guys have a million questions for me and I'm happy to talk about these things, but um, yeah, just keep in mind that for me, there's, trust me, don't worry, you guys, I'm not going to disappear. Um, that's not where my, eating disorder lies. For me, it really is about controlling what goes into my face um, because generally speaking, I'm not really in control of that. Well, you know, of course I'm in control of that, but I don't, I don't control it well. So that's where that is. I do want to say thank you to everyone for expressing your, you know, you know, your concerns and your love, you know, people were just very, very cool, right? And, you know, certainly um, at my age, I know my body very well. And I know that like, I'm walking around, you guys, I'm in pain, like my shoulders hurt. It, hurt, it, it hurts to like turn my head, it hurts to walk. And that's not, that's not me. I'm used to, you know, being able to run 10 miles and, you know, have that be great. And I have been running 10 miles, but it hurts. It hurts to do it. And I don't want that to be the case. So I hope that makes some things more clear for you. I probably, you know, I know that I haven't told you everything. And if there are things that people continue to have questions about, obviously you can, you know, drop them down there. Other than that, I'm gonna leave this here. So that's it for this video. Like it if you like it. Share, comment, subscribe. This is Reg signing off. Love yourselves. Peace. And I love myself.